<laughs> We're live. <laughs> hey everyone, and welcome to MakerCast. So, uh, what is MakerCast? MakerCast is a monthly stream that wanders from Maker Channel to Maker Channel. Although it has been on my channel twice in a row now, so you must be sick of me. I won't do it again. Uh, it's where makers share their latest projects. We always try to have some new people on, and they can talk about what they've been doing. So this week we've got some pretty exciting guests. We've got Stephen Hawes. Stephen's been building an open source pick and place machine. You can follow him on YouTube as he assembles his SMT assembly machine. I'm guessing at some point it will start to assemble itself. Who knows where it will end? <laughs> Adam Ork, AKA Deshipu, or just simply Sheep. This guy is actually too cool for YouTube. You'll find him on the Hackaday where he's got a huge number of projects. If you can think of something, he's probably done it already. Then we've got Jason Kuhn. Jason spends his time making electronic art. He hangs around on YouTube and at Evil Genius Labs. You can expect his part of the show to be illuminating. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> no, it was, it was good. Finally, we've got Microtype Engineering, AKA Kyle. He actually has a real job designing and assembling embedded electronics. <laughs> <laughs> he tries to take advanced topics and explain them to people like me. I actually feel quite sorry for him. <laughs> Check out the links in the description to find out more about the stars of the show. And of course, as your host for tonight, me, aka Atomic14. So um, I guess we should get the show well, started, that really. That was excellent. <laughs> that was, that was great. That was so good. <laughs> <laughs> so I think we all agreed that Stephen was going to go first. So we're dropping Stephen in it. So I will make Stephen the um, star of the show now. So let's cool. put him on the solo layout. Thank you, sir. All right, so I have been working on a pick and place for the past couple of years. And right now me and my buddy Lucian are trying to get the motherboards ready for sale. Um, and we want to make sure that every motherboard that we make is going to be, is going to work correctly and put it through its paces that everything that we wanted to be able to do is, is working the way we expect it to. Uh, so we have been jamming on this thing. I made a couple of videos about this um, a few weeks ago. Uh, this is a pogo pin test jig. So this is everything that's like brown here, we bought off the shelf. Um, and it's kind of a platform to be able to test a circuit board. We, all the red parts are FDM 3D printed to accept the motherboard design that we're working to sell. And then this blue piece in here has a whole bunch of pogo pins, uh, which go up to test points on the bottom of the board. Um, so that has been pretty cool getting all that mechanical stuff together, but the guts are, I don't want to say a nightmare, but they are very, they got really complicated. <laughs> and I think this is just kind of how these things go, but I'm not sure. Cause this is my first rodeo doing this either way. It's been so much fun figuring it out. So we need to take this motherboard. It runs Marlin, like the classic 3d printer, uh, firmware. Uh, so we need to, when we put the board in, it needs to flash test firmware to the board. And then it needs to run a whole bunch of tests like checking pins and checking peripherals and talking over I2C and stuff like that. And then after it's tested everything, it then needs to put test or a actual like Marlin build back onto it. Um, and then we wanted it to print a receipt out, like a, a report of uh, the Prusa. Actually, I think all Prusa products also have this. If you guys have ever bought one, you get like a receipt in the mail that shows all the, the test results out. Super cool. So we wanted to do that kind of thing too. Also, in case it needed rework, we wanted a physical thing that we could just like binder clip to it. So we know exactly what test failed. So we generally know what needs to happen in rework. So in the long and short of what's going on inside of this is there are three circuit boards kicking around. There's the blue one you saw up top, which is pretty much just a breakout for the pogo pins. Then there's this green one right here, which is effectively the same thing as the motherboard, except it's designed to just probe pins. So it's the exact same chip. It is the unbelievably expensive STM32 F407 VGT6 is what we're using for the board, which went from like $4 to like $50 a few weeks ago or a few months ago, which was devastating. But we have one of those on there, which pretty much will just probe all the pins um, that is kind of designed to interact with the test former that we actually put on the target board. So it goes through and it does all that stuff. Um, and it's actually talking back to a Raspberry Pi, which is running a Python script. And that's kind of deciding, okay, I want you to run this subset of tests. I want you to run this subset of tests. Uh, it's orchestrating the whole thing. After it gets the test results back from the microcontroller board, um, it logs it to a server. Uh, the Raspberry Pi does, the Python script. It saves all the data so we can access it later. So if someone calls in, they're like, hey, this is my serial number. This chip isn't working or this, this part of the board isn't working. We can bring it back to a jig or an operator or a 
you name it, we can really narrow it down or ba like based on the day. Um, so there's a lot of things we can do to try and figure out what went wrong with that production process. And then it prints out a receipt at the end, which was my favorite part, like getting the receipt print out to look good was so much fun. I spent like at least two and a half to three days just like tuning it so it looks really nice. And, like we put a logo in it and all that crap. So that was a lot of fun. Um, there's a lot of uh, black magic probes kicking around in here for actually flashing the firmware to the target board. And also that I still have in here to reflash the firmware that runs the test procedure on the test board. It's a lot, it's really messy. It's a lot of things just glued together, but it does work. It checks everything and it, and it poops out a little receipt at the end and logs the data to our server. Um, so this was super fun. We have not actually put it through production yet because of the second half of the thing that I'm working on. Let me pop on over to a different camera here. HD webcam. All right, I think that would work. Hello, okay, this is my, my mobile camera. So this is the pick and place that we've been working on. Um, and here is a, and a panel that we made of the motherboard. So these are the boards that we're actually going to be uh, populating on the machine and the ones that we test in that test jig. Um, and over the past few weeks, I've been pretty much living in this room, getting all these strip feeders set up, calibrating the machine. Um, and we've had some really good luck with placement so far. Let's see if my autofocus is gonna kick in here. Come on, baby, you got it. Um, nuts. This freaking camera is not, sometimes does not want to cooperate, but, uh, we've been getting really good placement. I did actually try and, uh, have open PNP connected. Uh, that's a little better. Uh, the software that we're using to run it is in this awesome open source project called open PNP. Uh, and we've, I tried to get it so that I could control the machine while we do this stream and I can just switch which camera is pointed to it so you guys can actually see the view of the machine, the two cameras mounted in the picking place, but it crashes open PNP every time I try and do it. <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> you know, we're here with this with this camera situation, but we're getting really good placement so far. It's This has been a project like two years in the making um, and getting like actual good results out of it has been nothing but stellar. So super stoked on that. Um, yeah, it's been really good. Now let me switch back my other camera. You guys aren't how to get up in my grill here. There we go. Um, yeah, so that's pretty much what I've been working on is getting open PNP calibrated. That thing is a beast. They like make sure that pretty much any machine that you want to control with it will be supported. So there are a million and one options and configurations and features, and you can pretty much have it talk to any machine you want. But that also means it takes a while to get it set up for any specific machine, um, kind of like the Swiss Army knife situation, but it's a really cool piece of software. Um, so yeah, hopefully pretty soon we're going to be actually just producing motherboards with the machine. So like doing the whole rep wrap building the machine with the machine thing. I am so excited for that when we actually get there. It might happen this week. So we'll see. We'll see where it goes. <laughs> well, that's pretty cool. So it is actually going to, it will be assembling itself then. But my joke is actually true. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it will be. There are two unique circuit boards in the machine. There's the motherboard, and then there's two ring light boards that go around the uh, bottom and top cameras. Um, yeah. The ring lights are like, they're really simple. They're some uh, WS2812Bs with some caps and, you know, like a few passes and stuff on them. The motherboard's much more complicated, and it has mostly through hole, um, but there's some finer pitch uh, SMT stuff that we're doing on it too. And yeah, so it'd be really sweet. We're, we, we, I've populated every part on the motherboard with the machine so far. It's it's just a matter of continuing to tune it at this point. Um, so yeah, it's gonna be really good. I'm super stoked about it. I can't wait to just start flying boards through it. It's gonna be really good. Yeah, Timonsky's <laughs> yeah, comment is really good. I mean, how do you stay so enthusiastic and motivated with it? I know projects I do that there's a certain point you reach that sort of hump and you just think it's good enough. I don't want to yeah. do it. I'm going to stop. I think I, I, I definitely think that the fact that I post a video about it every two weeks helps right. because like there are people that expect updates every two weeks and like, I have something to show. I need to have something to show every two weeks. Uh, yeah. and that is like astounding for motivation of like, I have a due date, like I have homework, to do, you know, <laughs> like it does help. Um, also it's just something I'm really stoked about. And I want it. Like I wanted this. I did a Kickstarter a few years ago for a little a light up bow tie, and I had to solder a whole bunch of the LEDs by hand, and yeah. it sucked. It took up like 
you know, six months of my life, just like killing nights and weekends, trying to make these things by hand. And it was horrible. And I couldn't afford like a Neoden or something. Um, so it's also something that I really want. I want to make it exist. Um, but also like having the motivation of like an awesome community, a bunch of really wonderful devs that are also working on the project too. Um, there's a lot of things that really help it, help it keep momentum, but mainly I'm just stoked on it. And I really want to see it be a thing, you know? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, your uh, your enthusiasm for it is infectious. <laughs> and, um, it. <laughs> close, closely, you know, watching, following the project, and uh, I'm, I'm excited. Yeah, about I'm excited it. too. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. yeah. your first customer. LEDs by hand is is terrible. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, I, how, how are you? Are you populating those those big old discs back there by hand? Uh, I, I have never built one of those by hand. I, I'll have pay other people to do that. <laughs> I would do smaller boards. Yeah. yeah. And, and I'll talk about that later more, yeah. but uh, yeah, I don't mind building one or two of something, but you know, 10 or 20 or 50 or a hundred. Yeah. It, yeah. it starts to get old real quick. And I love doing, I, I, I actually really, if I'm doing fine SMD stuff, I don't use a stencil. I just do them with an iron and like solder, which people always leave comments and like, why are you doing it this way? Use a stencil. And I like doing it, which is also a little ironic, but after a period of time, it's like, okay, the, the novelty has worn off with this thing. Like I just, I want yeah. a tool and not a project. I just want it to be a fixed, a solved problem and not have to think about it anymore. Um, and that's what we're, we're trying to make. Yeah. yeah. How many people are actually working on it? I mean, you're the kind of main guy, but how many people work on the pick and place software? I mean, it's open source, isn't it? It is. It's all open source. You can find everything, all the source, all the design for everything um, on GitHub. All the, the the CAD is in FreeCAD. We found a way to use Git to track KiCAD and FreeCAD ah, files. Uh, yeah. And it's a little bit of a dance, but we figured it out. And it actually works really well now. Um, yeah. But I'd say there's there's probably like four or five pretty regular active devs, um, people that have like the GitHub credentials. Uh, and yeah. then, you know, there's a long tail from there about, I mean, there's no at least a few dozen people building the machine along with us and like doing updates and stuff. Um, so it's pretty cool. It's, it's a lot of fun. Like, and it's the craziest thing to see people making modifications. There's a whole bunch of people doing cable chain mods. Now I have like nice. kind of this umbilical setup and a lot of people are like really jonesing on the cable chain. So they're making their own edits to it and figuring out how to do it that way. And yeah, it's, it's cool. It's pretty awesome. <laughs> Yeah, the, the whole, you know, rep wrap like 3D did for 3D printing, having that for picking place machines would just be amazing. It'd be sweet. It'd be so will, will cool. Be, will be amazing. <laughs> I, I am hoping that that comes soon. I really want that to be the case very, very badly. So, yeah. yeah. <laughs> and what will you do when you finish your pick and place machine? What's the, uh, when will it be finished? After it? Yeah. Um, well, when do you think it will be done? we will probably always be making improvements to it um, yeah. and finding ways to make it cheaper and make it more reliable. And like, it's mostly printed parts, um, but mm. we can still get like the other day, I was very reliably picking 0402s with it. And like, wow. uh, we're not entirely sure yet if we can support it outright, but like the signs are pointing to a likely yes. So it, it's it's pretty good um, for what it is. I mean, it's some seven aluminum extrusions and some printed parts and some hardware. Yeah. Um, uh, that's a question from the audience. Do you plan on selling assembled machines? Will you, will you go into full manufacturing? Yeah, that's definitely on the game plan. So we're kind of thinking about what are what are all the things that would be the most value add to people that are trying to do this. And a lot of the people who are interested in right now are people that are down to put a kit together. Um, so we're right now that's a lot of our focus. We want to get motherboards out the door because that's a very difficult thing for someone to make at home, but you can buy aluminum extrusion anywhere. So we were trying to enable as many people to get going as possible. Motherboards the first step. Um, and then after that is is going on for uh, kits and like we're thinking about assembled machines too for sure. Yeah. yeah. I think Adam's point hits home to me. Everything I do seems to go into more stuff to buy and more stuff on the shelf. Mm -hmm. uh, yep. It's terrible. It's a curse. <laughs> yep. Yep. <laughs> That's why I've shut my, it's my camera cool. down so much so you can't see all the crap around. <laughs> <laughs> That's fair. We will never ask you to do that. <laughs> <laughs> Brilliant. That's great. Any other questions for Stephen while we've um, got him at the I uh, have a question that's yeah. not on topic. Sorry. Uh, uh, is exactly. that a servo horn you have on your neck? Yeah, good eye. Damn. Okay. Yes. <laughs> Yeah, it's a, it's a, I don't even know what it is. Um, I had one that I got from Servo City. I bought a bunch of servos and they gave me um, a servo that didn't fit the servos I bought. So I had that one for years. 
Um, and then I got a new one and my girlfriend has my old one and now I have this one. So yeah, they're fun. They're a great little pendant. And like, it also like people like, is that a servo horn? And it's kind of like a fun little nod when people notice it. So good eye. <laughs> <laughs> What is it? Can you explain it? What's the... Oh, yeah, I'm sorry. Um, it's a servo horn. So like a servo right. motor. Um, I don't know, I guess. Uh, it's the thing oh, that like yeah. pops on the end that like for hobby, yeah. uh, hobby servo motors for like RC cars and stuff. Um, and this is a really nice purple anodized aluminum. Yeah, motor. very nice. Um, that's cool. Yeah, that's a pendant right there. I'm going to wear that. <laughs> <laughs> Brilliant. All right. Well, thanks, Stephen. Thank so, uh, Deshipu, are you ready? And you can tell us all how to pronounce your various names as well. Uh, <laughs> right. So, <laughs> uh, or, uh, yeah, and the shuffle on, on the net. So basically the the whole uh, plaque that last two years has have been for me, uh, the, the years of keyboards, uh, I got into mechanical keyboards a little bit because I finally found low profile switches, which change completely the whole thing because I, I couldn't use mechanical keyboard before for because they are basically too high for me and the the travel of the keys is too much so it feels like you are falling into it so the the, the low profile switches are amazing and the uh, problem was at the beginning there weren't really many keyboards you could buy with those switches so i had to make my own. I made this one, which I'm using right now, and I've been using it for one and a half year already. So it's uh, really nice. It has a, a, a socket in, in the middle where you can replace different modules. So you can put a knob on it or a display or whatever you want. But then <clears throat> you keep exploring, and there are several ways you can go. So you, you can, for instance, just keep adding stuff to it. Add some displays, add some LEDs and, and uh, stuff, make it shiny, blinking and all that. But for me, that was not really interesting because I don't look at my keyboard when I'm typing. So a display doesn't make sense. <laughs> so I so, you can you know this time building keyboards and you don't even look at them. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. It's, it's the feeling you are after, right? It's all tactile. Uh, so, so another thing you can do, people do that, is to go into exotic materials. You know, make uh, like keycaps out of uh, hardwood, or I don't know, machine it from aluminium and and things like that. But you know, it's expensive, and you need the right tools, and you need the skill to use those tools. And while it's all interesting to acquire those skills. It's a bit too much for me. So I went into the other direction, which is you know, making your keyboard as ergonomic as possible, as convenient, as uh, easy to type on as possible and as pleasant to type on. And, uh, you know, while all those other ways go like into the sky. So sky is the limit. You can basically always add more LEDs and you can find even more exotic material to make your keyboard out of. Uh, with with ergonomic, with like you start reading the research papers, you start experimenting, you, you look at other people's designs and you always end up with the same thing, which in my opinion should be the default uh, for, for keyboards which looks mostly like this. Sometimes it's in one piece, so you can, you can but uh, then it's tilted like this. And uh, this is actually not, not yet uh, the perfect one. The perfect one also has a splay, so the, the columns are not perpendicular. Uh, they, they, are, they have a bit of a, of a splay between them because your, your fingers are like that. And uh, people often uh, remove the third key from the pinky column because your pinky doesn't really reach that high. So then uh, either they move it to the side or, or they remove it completely and you tort two keys at once. So this particular keyboard is not my design. Uh, I got it in exchange for one of my PCBs. 
but it it, it shows you basically what what the <laughs> perfect performance looks like. You may not like it. <laughs> Is it like a community of keyboards? But uh, then when you make some like this, you start to think, okay, what if I put this on the back of a tablet like this? Oh, so, nice. And you wow. know, move the thumb button to the front. So you can hold the tablet at the same time and, and type with a nice ergonomic keyboard. Wow. And uh, yeah, for years I've been thinking about this, but never got uh, the time to, uh, to actually do this. And now I have it. Whoa. I actually made that. It's uh, It also has a, a little D-pad in here. So it can sure. And a joystick? Control. And this is an analog joystick. Wow. So you can use it for a mouse <laughs> and two mouse buttons. Oh. Uh, those are the thumb buttons. And those are basically the two halves of, of uh, the ergonomic keyboard, but you, you hold it. Let me, I don't have home, home keys, homing keys in here, so you hold it like this. Yeah. Basically. And your thumbs are here. So you have to hold it with, with the inside of your palm here. So uh, that's why I have holes in here. I need to actually make like wooden handles in here. <laughs> Because this is very sensitive to the size of your hand. It has to be just right for you. This one is a bit too small for me. That's why I, my, my uh, fingers are like those uh, hooks. And that's not convenient. It should be wider a little bit so that my, my fingers are mostly, uh, mostly straight, but uh, can still reach the, the uh, furthest. Uh, button that would be perfect. So I need a, a, a bit of a of a wooden part here to to you know adjust the the weight of this. But this already works pretty well. You can see there are some buttons in here. But yeah, <laughs> you know, first PCB of this design, you always get buttons. <laughs> and uh, it's actually surprisingly uh, convenient. It's nice. One thing I was surprised with is that, uh, you know, muscle memory is actually, well, actually works in absolute terms, not in relative terms. <laughs> so rotating something 90 degrees makes it stop working. So while I still know, like intellectually, where each key is and which finger I need to use and how far I need to, I need to move that finger, it's no longer in my muscle memory, so you can you you do have to train a little bit to, to use this to get this uh, you know automatic thing back. Do you have it automatic oh. yet? Uh, no. That's why I use this. <laughs> Quite, you know. <clears throat> so yeah, so that's still experimenting. And uh, yeah, you can actually use uh, like a very short USB cable with uh, this uh, OTG adapter on the other hand. By the way, this adapter is very nice. You just insert oh, it wow. inside of, yeah, the, sure. of the plug. Where'd you get that? That's awesome. Uh, where I get everything, AliExpress. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, so you can do basically. Uh, it's not USB C, so you have to rotate it three times before you can. <laughs> uh, yeah, so you can do. Uh, oh, wow, that's oh, awesome. Nice. <laughs> yeah. so the, the thing is, I, I lost my Velcro strips. I was planning to put Velcro strips in here so you can, you know, have the tablet held in in place securely with them. Right now it's just I, I, I have to actually hold it with my thumbs with trickle <laughs> from using my thumb <laughs> buttons, which kind of defeats the whole idea, but I tested it and it works pretty well. It works as a normal keyboard and you can type on it. Wow. Uh, and another thing I want to do with it. So I got this Hyperpixel display for Raspberry Pi. 
Oh. And you know, it just begs to put a Raspberry Pi in here. Oh yeah. And have a cyber deck basically thing. Oh. And you know, a power <laughs> bank underneath. And then you can you can do your hacking from the coach. So that's that's that. Wow. Uh, and the other long running project is this little guy. Ah, cool. Which is, as you can tell, probably a, a walking robot. I started. So, walking robots uh, is what actually got me into making some seven, eight years ago. But uh, at some point, I decided, okay, I need to make a robot that it that will be very cheap and very easy to make without needing uh, a 3D printer or a laser cutter, anything like that. And that would be cheap, like below $50. That was, that was my uh, thing. And uh, for a long time, I had uh, a problem that you really, nice, you really need uh, 12 servos to have three three uh, axes of, of motion uh, on each leg to be able to move it in 3D. Uh, because otherwise you are not able to move the legs in a straight line. And I really wanted to be able to move legs in a straight line because I wanted proper walking without the legs slipping, without you know crawling. Uh, because I wanted this to be like an, a platform to explore different ways of, of uh, doing the, uh, the, the walking robots. Because I, 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 at the time I thought there, there must be some unexplored uh, stuff that could be, simplify things. And if we got enough people to you know, experiment, then someone will sooner or later stumble upon <laughs> a nice improvement. But uh, later on, I, I decided, okay, so if I, instead of having the like spider configuration, where you have one servo horizontally moving the leg uh, horizontally and one servo rising and lowering it, instead, if I do a configuration like this, okay. which is basically the mammal configuration, but uh, uh, kind of uh, the, the joints are, uh, the, the hips are very close together. But it's uh, both servos are in the same uh, plane, and that means you can in that plane you can move the leg in a straight line, right? You can you can just kind of uh, so so at least as long as you are walking straight, you can walk properly. And then for for turning, I can do this like tanks do. By, by moving uh, one side faster and the other side slower or even in the opposite direction. So I came up with this design. That was the first and one. How many servos is that? Uh, eight. Eight. You okay. still need two, two degrees of freedom per leg. Right. So, but it's already, you know, uh, much cheaper. The servos are about one and a half dollar per servo. Right. So it adds up quickly if you have 12. Yeah, definitely. From yeah. AliExpress, of course. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, if you buy them in bulk like I do, because I have, you know. <laughs> 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 oh, man. Right. So the entire seven industry. <laughs> That's only $8. <laughs> <laughs> Right, so I, I started to, you know, make uh, more and more prototypes. At some point I decided, okay, I'm going to make this a feather, uh, uh, a feather wig, basically. So you can put, uh, um, no, not a feather wing, a feather. So you can put feather wings on top of this as shields. So you could have like a display for a face, for instance, or a LED matrix for a face or things like that. So I did that. And I buy, based this on Sandy 21 on uh, another project I made, uh, like a, a, a feather clone, basically, that I called Fluff. So this, this robot is called Fluff Bug <laughs> because it's, it's a fluff, but it's also a bug. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, recently, you know, there has been a shortage of chips 
probably you know if you use as the NCRC tool, so you, you must have noticed. Uh, so I just said, okay, what are the two chips that you can get right now? <laughs> and uh, that's RP2040 and uh, Espresso chips. So I, uh, and just around that time, there was, uh, there appeared a new, the, the ESP32 S2 chip. And uh, this very nice uh, module uh, by Lolin, uh, previously known as Wemos. You remember Wemos D1. So this is as uh, Wemos, uh, sorry, Wemos D1 Mini, which was uh, realized. But I, I have a clone here. They didn't cut the corners. They cut the corners by not cutting the corners on this one. <laughs> uh, but yeah. There is a lot of shoots for this, and I, I made like ten myself. So, so when this came out, and it's actually compatible with with uh, the D1 shoots, it only has a, a second row of pins to use all the uh, all the pins that you have on the S2. So, so this is great for for me. I decided, okay, I'm going to use this. It doesn't have Bluetooth, which is a bit of a, a bummer because then I could use like a, a Bluetooth controller for the robot, but I can use Wi-Fi on it. And uh, I just plug it in here. And another nice thing is that uh, Adafruit, Jeff uh, Apple from Adafruit is working on a camera support for circuit Python. By the way, this robot runs circuit Python. So uh, it, I, I'm still programming it right now. I can actually show you the startup sequence, but I, I, it doesn't work yet. I I have inverse kinematics for it. Cool. Uh, yeah, and I broke something and it doesn't work. Anyways. <laughs> <laughs> The live demo yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so the ESPS ESP thirty two S two is uh, one new thing in this particular prototype. The second thing is uh, I had actually a mentoring session during the Hackathon Prize uh, with Clement uh, DNF, and he suggested. Okay, I, I always have problems with with cable management. <laughs> you, can, you can see this nest of, of cables here. Yeah. And that's already after cutting the, the cables to the size. Because normally servers have cables like this. Because, you know, you, you put them in the airplane model and you stuff the cable inside and it doesn't get in the way. So uh, with the robots, it's, it's a big problem. Uh, the, the socket on the end, it's actually pretty difficult to replace when you cut the cable uh, to size. I didn't want people to have to do that. So what Clement suggested is, use, is to use those ribbon cable sockets. Oh, cool. Because you, they, they actually have like blades in here that, that go through the cable. So you just have to put the cable in the, cables in the right order and you close this and uh, cut off the, the excess and, and you are ready. So that's what I did in here, in wow. the back. That looks so I can, good. I can unplug it and you can see this is the... Yeah, that, is, that is clean. Yeah. yeah, that's awesome. Great idea. Oh. There are still some mechanical issues. I, I put the battery too low because the, the, those sockets have a key. They are keyed. So they have a notch at the top. And I had to cut off the notch from them in, in this version because the battery is still a bit too low and there is no room for that notch. Yeah. But uh, that's details, right? I, next version can have a proper... Uh, Yes. Oh, I can actually show you the previous version. <laughs> <laughs> so this is this. Oh, it's alive. Nice. <laughs> yeah, it. So then this version had an uh, infrared sensor because you could uh, so, so you could control it with a TV remote, basically. This one is going to have Wi-Fi. And I didn't finish. So Jeff Epler from Adafruit is working on uh, those uh, cameras 
for for a, a ESP three two S two. Basically, the same camera that was used in the ESP cam, <coughs> like M five stack also has uh, several modules with that camera. But he he's uh, making them work in Circuit Python, so you can basically uh, either record uh, animated GIF images, or or you could uh, stream it over web, over over the Wi-Fi, or you could uh, even if maybe there is a chance I could steal some code from OpenMV to do the Apple code thing. Apple codes are fiducials. And if I got the fiducial code to work on it, even you know with uh, one frame per two seconds, doesn't matter. You get, uh, uh, if the fiducial is seen by the camera, you get information on where it is exactly and how far from you. And yeah. at which, which angle. So if you have a fiducial anywhere in your room and, and the robot can see it, then the robot knows exactly where it is in the room. Probably you've seen those Boston Mechanics uh, movies with, uh, with the uh, Atlas robot moving boxes. And you notice there's something like a QR code on each of those boxes. Yeah. That's, that's the fiducial. That's, that's the thing by which uh, uh, the robot can know where the box is exactly and what box it is. Brilliant. Uh, on yes. Boston Dynamics. So that's the... Yes. So, yeah, they, they, the, uh, they use the so, so, <laughs> so, so I'm not sure I will be able to adapt that library. The library is open source. They, they made it available, but it's very, you know, uh, specific to OpenMV. Uh, so probably not, but uh, I can I can dream. So I have a separate project working on a shield for this with a camera, with that exact nice. camera that is supported by Circuit, Circuit Python. So then I can I can uh, put the shield on top here, so it will have like one eye in the middle. Maybe add some some you know time of flight distance sensors as well. Uh, yeah, possibilities are. Yeah. In I also have alternate legs. Alternate uh, legs. Uh, PCB oh, cool. with a with a switch. A limit switch on the end? That's sick. Yes. <laughs> so this is actually a switch they use for detecting if the SD card is inserted or not. Oh, okay. I, I use this because they are super light. Like yeah, uh, they require really no force at all to, to, yeah. to switch. So when when it touches ground. It, it activates and then you can you can write code that makes it pre prevents the robot from walking off your desk basically <laughs> it can it can say okay there is no ground there i i expected ground there so i can take a step back and turn around or whatever so yeah so so that's that's, uh, amazing. that's what i was working on it's it doesn't work yet because I need to rewrite. I have the code for, for walking, but it's for the 12 server robot. Right. And I need to adapt it for the 8 server one. And because it's there is nothing new in it, I already know how to do it. It's not exciting for me, so I don't have much. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> There's no pull towards accomplishing that goal. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I've been putting it for two years, actually. So, so yeah, I, one day I will just sit down and do it, but not yet. <laughs> you need to get that energy from Steven. Exactly, yeah. Yeah, yeah I would, Just a I fraction would, of it. <laughs> if you ever make that keyboard, if you have Bluetooth in it, I will literally super glue my phone into one because I hate typing <laughs> on my phone screen. It's like, and I have, I have, my phone is still like pretty big. I hate typing on it. Like if I would, I don't care if my phone's this big, I would carry it around as a phone with a full keyboard on it because that would just be so freaking awesome. Yeah. So there is one, one more problem with this. <laughs> what was it? You cannot like the device. You cannot put it away on the desk because it uh, press it's not the <laughs> <laughs> Or maybe if it sees that all the buttons get pressed, it puts the phone. Yes, yeah, I can do it. Maybe, maybe you, know, you know additional logic. Yeah, it wakes up yeah. when you pick it up. That would be cool. <laughs> yeah, that's that's a possibility. <laughs> So this should be, can we buy your keyboard? Is there any way to buy your keyboard? Is it a kit? Uh, is it not really. So uh, 
I put all the design files on Fitzing, uh, on on Hackaday, sorry, and yeah. it's made in Fitzing, by the way. So so it should be very easy to modify. Okay. But uh, uh, it is a bit of of soldering because this is a QFN something to one. Oh, right. yeah. uh, it's programmed in Circuit Python, of course, as well. Yes. So recently, because yeah. I'm a programmer by day, and uh, programming is not that fun for me when making things. So I try to uh, like motivate myself more to do programming. A lot of my projects are, okay, project is finished, I just need to program it. And that never happens. <laughs> and uh, so I try to motivate myself better to, to do it by using languages that are easier to program in and give you more like instant feedback, instant uh, gratification. So That's Python cool to is realize great. that about like the way that you work. Like if you know that you aren't really jazzed about writing the software for your own stuff, to pick something that has existing software support or something like CircuitPython is like, what a great move to just design around that. And that will help you finish your projects better. Like I love that so much. That's so cool. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, we need a bit of support from people. That's the uh, that's the key thing that keeps me doing projects is when someone else, either someone else tries to use it, and they find all the bugs, you <laughs> <laughs> can actually fix it, or they start adding stuff to it, and you're saying, sort of, "Oh, I better really do something about this because someone now someone's using it, and I've got to actually support it." I just support yeah. it. People actually yeah. care about it now. I, I actually have this exactly, yeah. thing that is really bad, and I try to not actually do it but my my first uh, uh like response to seeing someone is using my product oh, no okay first response is great someone is using my product it's actually useful that's, that's, <laughs> my, that's great but the second response is no you are doing it all wrong <laughs> <laughs> and i i really try to forget that because i know this doesn't lead to anything good but uh, <laughs> <laughs> that's pretty funny <laughs> yeah it is the support that's always the uh, difficult bit isn't it it's it's great publishing stuff and releasing it and you feel a great sense of achievement and then all the questions come and all the kind of issues come and then publishing all the people come than just putting it out there it's also it's, expecting all the people that will ask yeah, you about exactly, it there's yeah. a lot more to it than that <laughs> yeah. but it is good though it's great it's always good to get stuff out uh, but motivation is a difficult one. All day coding and then trying to code in the evening is not, yeah. not always a good recipe. Well, so, on the plus side, it makes the coding easier. So true. Yeah. yeah. That is true. Yeah. If you actually can code, it does help. <laughs> Although I think some people who look at my repositories might have a different opinion on that. So. <laughs> 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 well, possibly switching between all these different languages isn't always helpful. It's, uh, it's very hard going back to C++ sometimes when you're doing different things in your day job. That's always a uh, yeah. tricky thing. Especially if you have to do like, uh, a nice language in your, in your project, like Circuit Python, and then you go, go back to work. And, oh, well. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, which one's worse, the projects or work? That's the question. <laughs> Well, it depends on what you do at work. Do you do Python at work, or do you do like oh yeah, what, what do you do? C plus plus or something. Uh, I work on OpenStack, which is written in Python, so it's okay. mostly Python. Okay. But actually, because it's uh, a ma major project, so we mostly do maintenance. So in practice, I mostly program in YAML, no. which is not right. <laughs> oh, that's, that's yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Levels like the worst. Levels just kind of. I don't understand why it doesn't work. Why won't you tell me what's wrong? It's just kind of. Uh, yeah. I'm not going to tell you. It's just wrong. <laughs> <laughs> All right, brilliant. Oh, the shoot, that was great. Brilliant. Thank you. Looking forward to my keyboard, which I hope we'll get for Christmas. <laughs> yeah, if you ever have them up for sale, I'm there. I will. I will. I, you have my word. I will super glue it to my phone. <laughs> <laughs> brilliant. So next up is uh, is Jason. So uh, Jason, I think uh, we'll hand over to you. And I think, uh, as I said in my introduction with my joke, it should be illuminating. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, thanks for having me, Chris. Thanks for having me on my on my first Makercast. So um, yeah, my name is Jason Kuhn. I, I do in my um, limited 
free time, spare time, I, I do uh, Evil Genius Labs where I, I make uh, LED stuff and um, I sell some of the stuff that I make to you know fund uh, creation and development of, of new stuff. So um, I started about six years ago making stuff by hand, you know, before I knew how to make PCBs. So made stuff Ooh, like this, cool. which is a nice. hundred, a hundred holes hand drilled. I didn't have a drill press. Oh, um, wow. <laughs> so yeah. Uh, and then these are, uh, WS2811, uh, eight millimeter LEDs, um, just pushed through. And then on the back, there's a teensy, I think it's a teensy three, two driving it. So, and a, a button to, uh, change brightness. Cool. Nice. Nice. Cool. Yeah. So that was uh, one of the first uh, Fibonacci boards, at least, that I made. So that, you know, the LEDs are in a um, Fibonacci distribution. So, and then um, I actually did finally get a drill press and I started, I made a couple of these, Whoa. which is the same thing. Um, wow. But in a cool. stainless steel bowl. Um, which was fun to drill. Can it be used as a hat? Yeah, uh, I suppose. Uh, but you should see the oh. inside. <laughs> oh, yeah. oh, wow. So that's all. The, and I, I bought this pretty strong. I didn't have to do any. How long? Oh, story. how long did yeah. that take, though? <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, I don't know. Um, I, I kind of spaced out as I was doing it. You know, podcasts <laughs> and audiobooks. Is and, that a um, literal bowl? Like, did you it's buy a bowl. a bowl? It's a stainless steel mixing bowl from Ikea. <laughs> Is it from the kitchen? Uh, yeah. Uh, you can see the flat spot there that it would rest on, and I kind oh, of yeah. sanded off nice. the IKEA logo. So, <laughs> but yeah, they're just, uh, they're just I love the inside. That is amazing. That yeah, so, so cool. they're eight millimeter WS2811 uh, LEDs. So it's RGB LED with a little, uh -huh. each LED has its own little WS2811 uh, chip on a board there. Wow. And they, these come pretty strong. So, and I just kind of, routed them however it worked um, physically, and then in software yeah. mapped it out to the actual um, logical order of it. So How did you figure out where to drill the holes? For a flat yeah. sheet, I could imagine like printing out on a piece of paper and the line yeah. but like, how do you do it on 3D like that? That's crazy. Yeah, so that's exactly it. Yeah, I used, um, you know, uh, Python to to um, cool. generate the, the points and print it out a template for the flat one. And then for the round one, I started with one with a hundred only a hundred LEDs, um, and I had a, a oh, crack oh, out, um, nice. that just you know uh, made the three D model of it, and then used the software to unwrap it uh, like like paper craft, right? Yeah. And then cut it. This was before I had a laser cutter, so I used a uh, Cricut, crack cut, whatever, to uh, cut, and then fold and tape, and then tape this onto the bowl, and then <laughs> used a uh, permanent marker and a, a hole, uh, like a, a punch, you know, to, to mark, physically mark the uh, the bowl and then drill all yeah. those holes. And so that was the one with only 100 ladies. This was the one with 200. James has a question. What's yeah. the, what is the lead positioning? Is it random or geodesic? Or? It's not random and it's not geodesic. It's, it's a Fibonacci distribution. So, um, right. you know, if you start with the 2D one, start in the center, yeah, and then go out a certain distance um, and rotate by a certain angle. Um, if you use any rational number, the pattern will repeat. You'll end up with it being linear. Cool. If you use an irrational number like phi or phi, whatever, and rotate by the golden angle, then it will. You can always add another LED, um, and it will never repeat. They'll never stack up. Right, exactly the wow. Fibonacci, Fibonacci sequence. So, um, and then yeah, with just um, a little bit of scripting, you can do the same thing in 3D. So I made that uh, started with the papercraft templates, and then got a 3D printer and 3D printed. Um, I had a mini, so I had to do it in lots of pieces. Oh my gosh! Wow, that's cool. <laughs> and then uh, you know, put this on top of the bowl, and again use a, a, a permanent marker and a, a punch to mark the locations to drill all the holes. Um, but anyway, that, that gets old really fast, right? Like I made a couple of those and uh, sold a couple of them, but um, it doesn't scale, right? So um, I started learning to, uh, you know, design printed circuit boards. And then, you know, in the interim, I've, I've made um, Fibonacci LEDs uh, boards all the way from this one is 33 millimeters in diameter, so inch and a quarter. In diameter all the way to this one which wow. is 300, 320 millimeters so about 10 times the size 
Um, so this one has three and a half millimeter square LEDs, 512 of them. And this one has 64 one and a half millimeter LEDs. That's amazing. Thanks. Yeah. And so I've, like I said, I've made just about every size in between. So do, you have a back, do you have What's a background that? in like art or anything? Cause that is like super creative for us. <laughs> uh, no, thanks. Yeah. I, I, uh, <laughs> um, no, I, I, I don't, I don't really have a background in art. I mean, uh, and I, I took, um, our, the high school that I went to had a really great four-year electronics program. And so I took that and actually started out to become an electronic engineer before switching to computer science and, and then really didn't do much with electronics until just, you know, six or seven years ago, right? Arduino kind of ushered me back into playing with electronics. So, nice. And that's I, awesome. you know, not an electronic engineer. I literally play with blinky LEDs. Like that's, that's all I, mean. <laughs> I, I aspire to, I aspire to someday be able to, you know, yeah. actually put a microcontroller on one of these LED PCBs, right? Um, how, much, the, um, how, the, much, how much current do they draw? And what's the sort of power supply requirements for that, for that large? Um, yeah. yeah, so it depends. So like these can use, I think theoretically, uh, 60 milliamps each so times 512 it's a lot um, Adds but up. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. um but that's a full brightness uh solid white which you know just don't do it right um, yeah <laughs> they're not rgbw they just have the three dies for rg just just rgb i haven't okay. really done much with rgbw and, and that's mostly because i i use I, I love and use the fast led library yeah um and it doesn't yet support rgbw um so um, but yeah. yeah, maybe some someday that it will. Uh, I have, you know, I've done a little bit with the NeoPixel library, which does support that, and MicroPython or CircuitPython. But um, mm -hmm. I still do most of my pattern creation in uh, FastLED. Um, uh, so really, like all the so LEDs. The, so one I just, all on, the LEDs on current, place. the ones in the background, like I, I rarely drive them at oh. over two amps, oh. right? Um, I, I very rarely just, and, and you can actually like the fast LED library, you can set a max uh, current and it will adjust dynamically adjust the brightness to keep it below that threshold. Um, so, you, you know, even these large ones in the background, that they, they're probably not pulling over two amps. So that's so cool. Thank yeah. you. Um, Kendall says, you had a show question. them one in your sketches. Do you know what he means? What's he referring to, Jason? <laughs> oh, yeah. So uh, Kim Doc is a longtime member of the Fast LED community. And um, so I, I think he's just talking about the fact that I've been holding them up and not showing them. But uh, oh, okay. so <laughs> this is the same thing that's in the background there. Ah, um, cool. The, uh, the portal is into another dimension. Right. Yeah, exactly. So the smaller one in there hanging on the wall is a 512. Uh, the larger one is just a set of uh, off the shelf concentric rings um, that I just bought so that I didn't make that PCB. But um, yeah, I can show like the little one. So this is a magnetic uh, LiPo clasp connector that was made by uh, Deborah of um, Geek, Geek Mom Projects on Twitter. And so this is the switch and battery holder. And so you just cool. like, oh, wow. connect it. That's and, amazing. Yeah. yeah, I thought that was a, a brilliant idea. So she yeah. made a couple of those and sent them to me. We exchanged. Yeah. Um, and so, you know, you can actually wear it as a, a pendant. Um, and I, I think she actually did wear one to to dinner, uh, <laughs> yeah. a formal dinner. Um, what's, then, what's, the, what's the pattern that's being shown on that? Is that uh, so this is, is a demo reel made by uh, a guy on Twitter, um, trying to, uh, El Durko. Uh, I think his name is uh, Yaroslav. So he he made a a demo reel of some really cool um patterns and animations but so everything i make the code is always open source i always post it um so find all of that on my site and that I'll is get so that. cool yeah and so this, I have a question. Uh, this is just the bare pcb but then it has some black led acrylic on top of it oh so, nice so yeah that really so makes it look beautiful fire right. yeah. smooth better yeah right. Jeffrey, what's your question yeah, yeah so once you put all the leds into this steel bowl or which, whichever. Yep. How long does it take you to figure out which LED is which? <laughs> yeah. Happened, yeah. So it's definitely easier if I've made a PCB because I have the coordinates of them all. And then I can, I have the 
I know the physical order that they're routed in and um, the XY coordinates. And from that, I can calculate the polar coordinates, um, which is something I was actually messing with just this morning. This is one of my 256s. And so this is using, <laughs> this is using fast LEDs, uh, fast LEDs um, Perlin noise. Um, and so usually you would do that to, to do XY uh, um, noise. This, I just swapped um, angle for the x-axis and radius for the y-axis. Same exact code, um, and it does uh, really cool radial or polar uh, mapping. So, so do all do all of the boards now you're doing, or all of the designs? They're all on PCBs now, just to simplify things. Yeah, and just to make it faster, you know, to to be able to make multiple of them. So makes sense. Um, and I've started experimenting with um, multiple sizes of LEDs. So at the suggestion of uh, uh, JP oh. John Paul oh. on uh, Twitter. So this is not only do that. These are one and a half millimeter LEDs in the center, and then two millimeter, and then three and a half millimeter, and then five millimeter, and then but they also increase <coughs> in spacing. Um, as they radiate out from the center, so that's are they 60. also RGB? You you got They're, some RGB like individually addressable ones that yes. small? Yeah, and it's so in the center they're the same LEDs that are on the little tiny. Oh yeah, okay. They're, uh, they're cool. actually SK sixty eight oh five one and a half millimeter square. But it talks the same language as the WS twenty twelve. Yep, that was a concern. So this was a prototype, and I wasn't sure if just chaining them because this is all one strand, right? Yeah, um, they yeah. all talk the same protocol close enough that it just works. And That's cool. <laughs> I made a 256 version. Of, oh. um, what about brightness? Do they differ in brightness? Probably like different yeah. sizes. Yeah, probably, but you can adjust for that pretty easily yeah. in software. I so saw. have you have you tested those yet? Mm -hmm. Yeah, they were. Yeah, um, I don't I don't have one assembled to light up, but yeah. Um, so do they end up actually looking that much different than if they're all the same? Not really. Not really. <laughs> I, I, haven't, I haven't bothered adjusting for it. Or code, so, but you they do look very different when they're not on. Them. Yes. I mean, like, right, right, right. Yeah. yeah. That's what I was that. thinking is the brightness would overwhelm the actual like size of them. Yeah. God, yeah, it does look cool, cool though. It does. Yeah. Are they um, aluminium PCBs? Someone asked. I, I, I haven't. <laughs> No, they're all just they're just two layer FR four. That's all I've yeah. I've done so far. Um, I haven't had to go to a four layer, or six layer, or more. And then um, um, I haven't tried aluminum um, PCBs. But um, again, I just I, li I drastically limit the brightness. Like I rarely drive any of these. <laughs> yeah. They're just yeah. blinding. At, yeah. e even behind diffusion, they're blinding. I, I usually run them at maybe a quarter brightness or an eighth yeah. brightness. So. So one um, thing that I, I recently noticed is that uh, they started making RGB LEDs that are not for lighting, but for signals, and they take much less current and they are much yeah. uh, less bright. Right. Yeah. So, so the the little one and a half millimeter ones, and I think the two millimeter square ones also, um, they only consume like maybe I think they're five milliamps per channel per LED. Yeah. So yeah. fifteen milliamps as opposed to thirty or sixty. Sixty. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so, and, and sorry if I'm running long, just real quick. No, 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 we've got plenty of time. Let's, uh... So more recently, I wanted to try my hand at PCB art. Um, so this is that's uh, amazing. That's the Kraken that board so that I made. And yet he's and... still not an artist, guys. Uh, <laughs> so... Definitely not an artist. <laughs> not an artist at all. <laughs> uh, so this is not my design. I, I just bought, bought the design clip art. Okay. Right? <laughs> art. Um, imported that in, in Eagle. And so there are, you know, uh, gaps exposed FR4. And then it's just a sandwich of, of nice. um, boards. So below this is a PCB with LEDs specifically laid out, you know, to follow the, the pattern, the arms and everything. And then just another PCB for the back plate. Uh, Beautiful. So. How did you get it to come through with the the solder mask? Did you like have to figure out like how to raster it in a weird way? Because like as far as yeah. I'm aware, it's only like kind of like a, a binary thing. You can't do like a half opacity, you know? Right. I mean, you can dither it. Um, yeah, but, dither is the word yeah. I was looking for. <laughs> right. Yeah, you can dither. Um, this was, you know, uh, it was vector art, and I, I brought in and didn't didn't really have to do any of that. Okay. Um, and I actually converted it to raster. You know, just a one bit per pixel bitmap okay. imported into eagle which it becomes millions of little rectangles yeah. and then just you know put that on the 
uh, what the resist layer and, um, you know, for the solder mask and then to um, keep the FR4 exposed, you know, yeah. all the way through on, yeah. on both sides of the PCB mirrored on the back so that the, so that the, the LEDs would shine through. Uh, so let's know first... what that fab thought when you sent that to him. <laughs> uh, yeah. We had questions coming back. I, I think yeah. you might have sent the wrong thing, sir. <laughs> they, they did warn me that they could not guarantee the quality um, of, of it, but uh, honestly, yeah. they, they turned out great. Um, and so the LEDs was... kind of helped to blend everything, it looks like. Yeah, yeah. So this was my second attempt. I have, you know, keeping with the color changing <laughs> animal shade, um, that's the chameleon. And then that's I had to try cool. it in. Had to try it with the white solder mask wow, and black. So mask. cool. Black so you also have oh, on this one. actually using yeah. animals that uh, change their skin color, color, right? Right. Yeah. Exactly. So there's, you know, the octopus has what um, chromatophores, I think, is, is yeah. what they're called. And yeah, this one doesn't have any silk on the uh, on the top board. This one does have both silk and, you know, exposed FR4. It's beautiful. Um, wow. Yeah. And back, and then yeah, uh, I thought white turned out really nice as well. So, and when will you be selling those? <laughs> um, they they are for sale already on my Tindy store. Um, Sweet. I think cool. I think I have oh, a nice. couple of in, of them in stock. So, I don't make you know I don't mass produce them. I I, I make fairly limited batches yeah. as I as I feel like it, um, and put them up, and then that funds the development of the next project. Which, speaking of. Um, so this is <laughs> my latest project. Oh, oh my gosh. And so nice. this, this is a small scale test. And these are, I think it's 192 LEDs. There's 19 uh, rings of them. And then each, <laughs> each LED circle has a um, touch pad in the center. No way. And then That's... I use M2 screws. So if I turn this off. Oh, it's a cap touch pad. Right. Um, so you can see there's M2 metal screws. And um, there's breakouts for all the touch pads. And I'm oh. struggling again with software, um, trying to get the capacitive touch uh, sensor working. Um, so so it, it, this what, will what be, are you this using will be for touch, your um, What is it? NPR, I, I, programming just Arduino, um, but the oh, touch sensor that I'm trying to use is like an NPR121, which is a 12 channel uh, level shifter. And so, I'm just doing all of this on a breadboard right now, if I can show that. Um, so there's two two of those capacitive touch sensor breakouts on a breadboard and then just a uh, ESP8266 dev board. So if I can get the software to work um, and get the small scale test to work, then I'm gonna make one as large as I can. <laughs> um, <laughs> Yeah. What's the, then, what's the biggest one you've ever made? Is it the the three the three hundred twenty millimeter okay, one, one, yeah. which is the largest that the um, so this was um, actually some of my boards are assembled by um, Cy Cyber City Circuits in uh, Augusta, Georgia, and this is about as big as the reflow oven right. uh, will work. So, <laughs> so, but I already have plans to make a Fibonacci ten twenty four. And to do wow. that, I'm going to split the PCB up into puzzle yeah. pieces. No way! No. That that fit together and will mount with standoffs. So this is a small scale test. This is just a 86 millimeter, 64. Um, and I was really curious. I made no allowance for like inside corners whatsoever. Um, and I was really surprised that they fit. Um, very, very tightly together. Yeah. So I didn't have to, uh, you know, account for like the sharp corners on the inside, the, you know, the radius of whatever, you know, one millimeter bit that they route these mm -hmm. with or whatever. Um, I wonder if they just so default here. to routing too much and like cutting out too much of the PCB as opposed to leaving yeah. a little bit of excess. But maybe, but I mean, so here's one that I mounted with standoffs and it's wow. Really you can't even tight. see the gaps. Yeah, yeah, you can't tell. Yeah. You really can't. And by the time the LEDs are lit up and there's um, <laughs> acrylic diffusion on top of it. Um, yeah. So this worked. Um, so I'm going to, I'll, I'll do a, another slightly larger scale test. And then if that works, I will do probably a 500 millimeter um, <laughs> uh, 10, 1024 board in probably eight different pieces is the, the current plan. So, wow. and then I, I'll need a larger laser cutter uh, to be able to acrylic <laughs> for, um, 
<laughs> the acrylic for the 512 and the, the large rings I had cut by Polo Lube because they're they're already too big for my small laser cutter. Yeah. So. You can make the wackiest Frisbee ever. <laughs> yeah. Right. yeah. yeah. Wow. Um, so yeah, sorry, that was a quick tour of my descent into LED madness and uh, <laughs> <laughs> projects. So um, yeah, quick question. Yeah. Do you buy these fully assembled or do you solder them all by hand? What's so the, I, almost, I almost always assembled the first prototype by, by yeah. hand. So I did just out of frame. I have a, uh, microscope, for, uh, you know, stereoscopic mi microscope for, for assembling the really tiny boards. And I have a little uh, handmade or a homemade reflow oven back there using Unexpected Makers Reflow Master. Nice. Um, the larger boards, I've, I've never assembled a 512, so I was outsource assembly of those. Yeah. Um, the, the 256 boards, I had um, Ben Hink of um, the, the guy that makes uh, Pixel Blaze assembled some of those. And then Cyber City Circuits um, does assemble for me. I, I've had some assembled by JLC PCB with varying, you know, results. <laughs> um, you know, uh, um, yeah. yeah. So, follow up question. Yep. Are these open sourced? Uh, well, so, all of my software is open source. I have okay. yet to open source any of my hardware. Um, I did just recently, um, so, so I, I actually, the first. PCBs that I made were just little level shifter PCBs. Um, and I recently uh, opened them on Oshpark. So uh -huh. I can just order, order them directly from Oshpark. Cool. And I will take those open source, but they're just little, you know, like a breakout board for a, like a 74 HCT 245 level shifter. Uh -huh. um, yeah. Can you show the Hexi again? Special request. <laughs> oh, yeah, again. yeah. <laughs> yeah, the, this, uh, let's see. Yeah, let me find that story. Um, yeah, I'll get this plugged back in. Any other questions while I do that? Uh, I'm slightly worried that Carl and I still have to go. And I'm, not, I'm thinking my stuff's not really going to match up to that. So. <laughs> <laughs> so, the key uh, is just to not even try. <laughs> <laughs> then you won't be disappointed. <laughs> wow. Jason, I wonder if the, the screws that you're using, I don't know if this is even remotely an option or like this could be it, but maybe they aren't conductive on the surface if they're coated with something. And maybe that's why you're having a problem with cap touch. Like, are they conductive? Do you get continuity end to end on them? They are in so much that um, you can touch the nylon standoffs that I use and it will still work. <laughs> that's so, cool. So here is a, a touch. Um, so the, the smaller boards that I've made, I've started putting cap touch pads in the corner. Um, and so when you touch them, oh my gosh. Yeah. Um, and so even mounted behind acrylic like this with nylon standoffs, you can touch the nylon standoff and it will still wow. trigger, trigger the touch. So. Okay. All right. Uh, wow. That's cool. That's insanity. Thanks. Yeah, actually that proximity based, not touch based. The touch thing is a bit inaccurate because they, they measure the capacitance. So yeah, well, and so like this one uses the Adafruit's uh, QT Pi, which is like a at SAMD twenty one, and it has built in yeah. it has a built in touch peripheral. Nice. And yeah, so they're just using the Adafruit 10, library for that. No, it can do six six channels of touch. Yeah, that is so cool. Yeah, Thanks. wow, that is amazing. Thank you. <laughs> I should, have, I should have been wearing this the whole time. <laughs> All Steven has is a servo horn. <laughs> <laughs> not a contest, Kyle. Well, it's, tiny. <laughs> it's not a contest, but if it was. I'm glad it's not a contest. He would win. <laughs> I mean, guys, we don't have anything. So that's <laughs> it. We just end the show now. <laughs> I have a pencil in my hand. <laughs> Yeah, oh, I think that's a good point from David. Yeah, getting the blink sketch to work is still pretty good. So that's exactly. Right. Right. That's yeah. right. well, that was absolutely amazing, Jason. Uh, Thank you. Thank you. I'm blown away. So uh, Kyle, you. You got that. <laughs> <laughs> so next we've got Kyle. So oh, Kyle, micro technology, no micro microtype engineering. So Kyle, let's uh, should we stay on the screen because you want us to quiz you about stuff? 
um, question here. So. Um, you know, I can at least I can at least start going through some stuff. But yeah, definitely, we'll probably want to do some sort of like Q and A type stuff. Um, but yeah, definitely. First off, we just need to kind of lower okay. those expectations a little bit <laughs> um, because they are certainly not going to live up to that. But um, so yeah, like uh, like we were saying or talking about in the intro there. Um, yeah, my full time gig is doing electronics design, and I kind of used the analogy like a mechanic doesn't work on their own car. So I don't do a ton of stuff like on the side, like maker type stuff. It's all pretty much uh, work based. So I can't really show really any of the work type stuff. But what I think I'm going to do is, and this is something I've been working on getting going on my channel for like a year or two now. So something that is really, really overlooked in a lot of hobby level or even people who are getting into like the professional side of circuit board design is like just because a design works doesn't actually mean like it's a good design um, either emissions wise or safety wise or reliability wise. So I've started doing a series going through like EMC. So electromagnetic compatibility or compliance is what a lot of people refer to it as. So a board that I did for this, and I have a green screen, so it's probably going to somewhat disappear. Uh, I think you can kind of see that. And here I'll switch. I'll switch over to my um, screen here. Cool. So basically, so this is the design that I just showed. It's a honestly like the coolest looking uh, or the coolest buck converter that I have ever messed with. I did a uh, series going over it, but basically it's a I squared C or a PM bus controlled buck converter. So it can take in up to like 20 volts on the input side, and then it can output pretty much whatever you want. And it has like strapping pins. You can set what the frequency is. You can set what the voltage is. You can set the uh, I squared C or the PM bus address. But then you can also use I squared C to set any number of registers. So like you can do what you can monitor what the current is. You can set current limits. You can set output voltages. You can set pretty much whatever you want on it, which is really unique in a buck converter. Cause normally if you want to have say like a semi variable supply, you're going to have to use either something to adjust one of the feedback resistors, or you're going to have to use like multiple regulators, which is pretty neat in something. And I was planning on kind of going through and joining like the the true maker side, like the, the <laughs> Tindy side and, and selling some of these, but I probably won't. So I'm just ending up using this board as kind of like the test bench for the uh, EMC series. So I'll pull up just real fast what the uh, board looks like. Uh, so four layer board, outer two are uh, signal, to enter our reference planes and a buck converter is a really, really good board for testing and messing around with EMC or EMI issues because especially conducted emissions. So something that, and I've been seeing it recently with some people on, uh, on YouTube and some other platforms. So like buck converters, they have to have input capacitors to make sure that it's able to like supply the instantaneous current on the output side. In a lot of uh, data sheets, they'll just say like, hey, you need like 47 microfarads of input capacitance. So people will, whoops, people will go ahead and throw in a single electrolytic. Oh gosh. And I don't use the new KiCad version all that much yet only on YouTube. So I'm still not really used to it. So people will throw like a single electrolytic in here and be like, sweet, it works. <laughs> so that's what I tested. So that's what I tested in this, my 
most recent video. So I set up a decent like pre-compliant setup for like a CISPR like 16 or 25. They all use kind of the same standard. And I hope you can kind of see this. I don't know if I can zoom in. Uh, maybe zoom double. Did absolutely nothing already then. So, oh yeah, someone just keen commented. Yeah, I can now put up to 15 amps. So it's also a super high powered regulator. So basically using that setup that I just showed. So uh, right here and actually without this ferrite. So these were just connected across. So with a single, or actually I think there were uh, the three electrolytics. So with just electrolytics here, anything that goes over this line, this blue line here, which I know is probably hard to see, but anything that goes over that line and anywhere you see numbers are all spectrums of the frequency here that would fail pretty much any compliance test on the conducted emissions. So is this an FFT of the output voltage? Yeah, it's um, with a true spectrum analyzer. So okay. it's doing the FFT there, um, either through real time or a true FFT. But yeah, so this is breaking down all the different frequency components of the voltage swings on the sure. input wire. So okay. it's conducted right. emissions. So okay. yeah, let me, uh, good, good point. So basically the rough setup here is conducted emissions is they, when you're testing this, they want to make sure that whatever you plug this into, it's not going to send noise back to it and interfere with that thing that you plugged it into, or it's not going to send worst case back into the main supply and screw something up there. So conducted emissions isn't anything radiating. It's only on the actual wires itself that go back to the source. So basically on this input side, you throw it into a listen, a line impedance stabilization network, which super fancy way of saying it, it, separates out the noise that your circuit produces from the input side and it makes sure that it's set at a a known impedance so you know it's reproducible and it's going to be consistent no matter how you're testing it and i mean it's obviously this is really oversimplified but big and long and short of it is this is measuring noise that is on the wire that goes to your input supply so any one of these peaks, the first peak here is the fundamental frequency. So that's at one megahertz. And you can see in the table down here. So anything that's above roughly 60 dB UV, so decibels, microvolts would likely fail. So we have some, and I was changing the current here. So I think this is at like five or eight amps. So we can see all the way out to like the 15th, 16th harmonic, it's going to fail, wow. which is what you would expect because with just using electrolytics, and this is this is kind of the goal, like with the intro, like I try to explain fancy stuff to, to people who might not know it. And it's like, this is such a gotcha because it's like those data sheets say you need bulk capacitance. You have to have capacitors that are this size. Yes, that's true, but these capacitors have such a high internal resistance or ESR equivalent series resistance that every time your output, the buck converter switches on and off, it essentially sends a massive voltage surge on the input side. And that's what causes radiation or causes it to radiate or to conduct. The reason why the switching regulators are super good to test conducted emissions is because they're low frequency. So anywhere from like, this is a megahertz, but you can get in the hundreds of kilohertz. That's at like the prime frequency for conducted emissions. Like this test goes from uh, 150 kilohertz up to 30 megahertz, pretty much all main FCC or any CE standards. That's what they measure to. So a switching regulator is like the perfect candidate for that. Not to say that they won't radiate also, but they just don't typically have a tendency to radiate as much because if it's going to fail on radiated emissions, 
it's almost certainly going to fail conducted emissions even worse. So like this board here, sure, it probably would fail radiated emissions also, but it <laughs> doesn't really matter because it's so hor horrifically failing here. <laughs> so then what I did is I put back all the ceramics, so exactly as I designed it, and put back this ferrite. So the ceramics here, yes, they're they're pretty big. Most of these are 22 mics, uh, but they they lower the impedance massively of this whole input network. So those voltage surges that are coming from the output side, they're that less likely to travel back. And then same with the ferrite bead. So I changed that out wow. and now this right. was the result. And is that so, maybe because ceramic capacitors have a much lower ESR than electrolytic does? It's, like they're quicker to dump their, their stored charge? Yeah, it's ex uh, exclusively that. Okay. Um, that's the whole reason. So you can see here, we still have the fundamental, and this was at eight or 10 amps. The listen only is rated up to eight or 10 amps. Um, and you can see the fundamental frequency is still in the danger zone. So the big thing with pre-compliance testing is you can only do so good. So you want to always have a gap here. So, and this isn't the true standard. I was still getting my uh, actual software set up, which shows the actual compliance limits, but 60 is a good average. If it was at like 60 ish, that's still way too close because you don't know what it's going to be at an actual test lab. So the fact that it's at 70 dB microvolts is way too high. This still, I would fear it wouldn't pass. But what's crazy is like you see every single harmonic is completely shunted down. It's only in that fundamental. So now I change the stop to 10 megahertz and you can see a little bit closer how it's still failing on that fundamental, which again, kind of makes sense because the single one megahertz surge has a ton of power because that is the, the the fundamental that it's drawing all of its current based from. And the only series filter that is here is a ferrite bead. So what I'm going to go into after this, and I don't know how much, I, I don't want to keep going on with this because I know it's probably a little excessive for, for what we've been going through, but there's a bunch of different like series filter elements you can use here that will have a much, much higher impedance at a lower frequency. Ferrite beads really only are effective in the tens of megahertz to the hundreds of megahertz. So it's really not doing a ton to help filter that noise from getting back, but it still obviously helps and it helps a lot with the upper harmonics and it helps a lot with radiated emissions. But yeah, I mean, the, essentially the spiel with this and like kind of the videos I'm doing is it's like basically just because like a data sheet, especially anything with a switching regulator or, or anything that has uh, super fast rise times, just because it works and just because everything seems good doesn't mean it's actually a decent design that will pass any sort of standards. So there's just some like simple things you can do, like making sure you're, you're paralleling your caps and doing whatever you can to make a decent filter network that kind of go a long way there. Um, but yeah. That's crazy that's, that you were completely following what the data sheet suggested that yeah. you do mm -hmm. and it failed so terribly. And like, they don't specify in the data sheet that you need to have a mix of different like um, capacitor chemistries to like be able to actually keep it moderate. I guess they're not... I, 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 do they just not think about what you might, what kind of testing and regulation you might need to apply your board to when they so it's, put it's that kind in of, they, they honestly, and this is also something I, I talk to about a lot because it's pretty common data sheets. They don't really care. Um, it's not really their, <laughs> and it sounds in one of the jokes, um, Gary, who, who works for me, uh, he's like an old school designer started like before the, uh, the ECAD side and his, his joke is always, they have the interns write the data sheets, which <laughs> as true as that is something like this, it's like, it's something that if you're going into a professional design, it's something that should be known, but it's yeah. something that you don't hear about 
talked that often in like the the maker or the hobbyist space because again most people including the people who are selling a lot of products online in smaller quantities if it works it's good like that's all they care about and it's not that that's an, a fault or it doesn't make sense it's just kind of by nature and there's just a lot of stuff like the worst to your specific point the worst uh issue with this is texas instruments and i love their data sheets they normally have the best yeah. but they have a series of switching regulators called uh, simple switchers and they're in their normal switching frequencies are in the two to four hundred ish kilohertz range and they will literally specify a single tantilium or uh electrolytic and it'll be like since it's a lower switching frequency you have to use a larger size. So we're talking like a 470 microfarad electrolytic oh, with yeah. a 250 or 470 uh, kilohertz switching frequency. And it's like never in a million years is that going to pass, but it'll work. <laughs> so yeah, it's just, and that's that's kind of my goal with this whole, the whole series here is just kind of come up with some like generalized things here that are like, hey, yeah, that works, but just, even just by adding some lower ESR caps, you're going to be so much better off. You don't even have to have a fancy ferrite or a pie filter, something like that. But yeah, it's kind of crazy, like like testing. And if you were to take like pretty much any buck converter board from Amazon or AliExpress, every single one of them will fail. And usually it's not even going to be close. And it's just kind of crazy because it's like switching regulators, as much as people love to use them, the rule of thumb that I always kind of use is if you don't have some sort of filter and that's typically like a pie filter or a ferrite something, it's going to fail. So it's like, it's such an important thing and you can get in massive trouble with FCC or CE or whatever by not doing it. Yet very few people other than massive companies or people who have gone through the full compliance testing, very few people actually do it. It's kind of crazy to think about. Same with like a lot of the safety standards, UL or IEC. So if you were to actually try and get this board approved and you brought it to the FCC and you got all the, the testing done and stuff, you were going through a, a wide range of like loads, like how much mm -hmm. current you're expecting to pull from this thing. Would you also, would the FCC expect that you'd also have to change uh, like through that ITC interface you talked about, what voltage it's actually regulating it down to? Or is that based on the application? Like, although in software you could technically make the voltage a different mm -hmm. output voltage and like maybe then it fails do they take what you would your, your intention of the design and not every possible variable you could turn in the design like in software would they make you test that the output voltage as well even if you were never planning to change it yeah so super super good point um and this is where it really depends or ultimately a generalized like in the united states and i obviously see as I'm sure anyone in this space knows, has been an absolute mess lately with how they're starting to enforce things, which is completely different than they have been. So the US is a bit bit simpler, a bit cleaner. So if it's a board like this, that is a unintentional radiator, like it is not supposed to send out anything. It doesn't have any RF on it. You don't have to take it to an FCC accredited lab. You don't have to have them there telling you exactly how it has to behave. All it has to do is under whatever use you're going to be using, it can't exceed whatever standard it would fall into. So it's whatever it would be used in. So like if you were to go to like Intertech is really big in the US, they can do pretty much any standard. As long as it's under its normal operating use and it doesn't exceed it, that's all they care about. It doesn't matter like you said this board being an evaluation board, I mean, technically what you said, yes, it would probably have to be every single scenario, mm -hmm. but in the U S evaluation boards are pretty exempt, which they used yeah. to be in the CE. Now they're not, it kind of sucks. But with the U S if it's an evaluation board, it's up to the end user, whatever it's the sum of all of its parts to make sure it doesn't exceed it. But FCC in the U S you can sell pretty much as long as it's not an unintentional radiator and as long as it doesn't get reported and then they go out and test it, which at that point you're so beyond screwed. 
So that's why. <laughs> and, and you can see that there's, they put out a report every year of, I actually don't know if it's officially through the FCC or it's a watchdog, but there's a report put out every year where it shows the fines and uh, ish, uh, citations levied for companies. And it's almost always intentional radiators, to be fair. It's, it's not too common that it would be something like this. But it's one of those things, like even if someone else is kind of competing with you and they're like, oh, I want to bring him down. They take one of your boards, they test it. And if it exceeds it, you're screwed. And it's like you have to recall all of those boards. You can get a massive fine over a board that works. And it's like it makes sense. But, yeah, some of that stuff's pretty harsh. Now, UL, UL does exactly what you're saying. That has to be an official, an official. <laughs> yeah, right. All of my boards are unintentional radiators. <laughs> <laughs> except, except the ESP on there. Right. <laughs> but then it's a kit, and that's but a different delineation. Kit, yes. <laughs> yes, that's fine. Some assembly required. Some yeah. assembly, yes. <laughs> But yeah, it's pretty. Know, it's, good point, though. Most makers aren't really even thinking about this kind mm -hmm. of, or don't even know that they should be thinking about this stuff. It's uh, it is a pretty kind of scenario that people try not to think about because they know yes. they're probably not really doing what they should do. And it's to get quite to do. The yeah. fact that Dindy even exists is, is crazy. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> How does the FCC not shut them down? Like, is there legal <laughs> reasoning behind that? I mean, like, you could... They're pretty exempt. It, it, okay. falls, it falls on the OEM because they're yeah. just a third party. So, like, an yeah. example, like UL. So, UL, again, mostly mostly US. Um, some of theirs and, like, the IEC standards, if it, like, touches mains, are required by law. Like, you can't sell it without it. But... Yeah. Like stuff like this, it's purely for liability. If you can say your widget's gone through UL testing, it lowers your liability insurance. It helps every aspect. Almost all big box retailers require UL testing on everything. Like if you go into Walmart right now, every single electronic gizmo in there will be UL listed. Most big boxes do that. They do that to prevent them from getting sued, where Tindy... I guess everything just falls right on the OEM. That that's the only thing I can think of because yeah, they don't they don't give a no, crap. That's actually not how it works. They actually are responsible just they are. step on the mine yet. I don't know how. I mean, you can see people on there literally selling like non-protected lithium ion cells. And it's like <laughs> that's as terrifying yeah. as it gets, man. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's it is pretty fun. Um, <laughs> <Wild. laughs> yeah, what's, uh, what's, what are some simple things that we should be doing or things that a hobbyist can do if they're designing a PCB or a board? What's some obvious things that they miss that they could get 90% of the way there or at least make it not completely rubbish? Um, I mean, the biggest thing is, is honestly, there are a few things. Switching regulators cause the vast majority of failures um, almost every time. The other thing is if it's, if it is a regulator or even if it's not, you almost always fail because of wires, because you have to think like if you have other than Jason's massive boards, I'll, I'll exclude him from this <laughs> talk, but your average circuit board is small, like on the order of like this. Yeah. And in order to have emissions, you have to have three things. You have to have a source of energy, you have to have a antenna, and you have to have a receiver. For the sake of testing, the receiver is obviously the test chambers antenna. The energy, a lot of times you can't do a ton about it. So it's your antenna. Where is your largest antenna on almost every board? It's the wires. So most test failures and radiated emissions are from the wires. So making sure you don't have any ground loops, making sure it's shielded properly. And I saw someone jokingly in the chat saying like, oh, just cover it in aluminum foil. That is how a lot of products pass uh, uh, radiated emissions because it works really well. The bigger your reference plane is, the better you're going to do from virtually every test. 
So oh, yeah, they're they, unintentional radiators because if they're intentional, oh, yeah. then you've just lost a, a feature of your product. Oh <laughs> yes, <laughs> or you add a little uh, purposeful antenna there. Yeah, put one outside. Yeah. Yes, yeah. Um, but yeah, I mean, watch watch your switching regulators, watch your wires, um, making sure you have ceramics everywhere. Uh, you can definitely get into trouble, and there's always, and that's also a thing I've been trying to work on, is getting rid of like the it depends answers. Because like EMC is full of like, oh, it depends on the application, which is true, but it, it, it gets people scared or get turns people away because they're like, well, I don't know if it depends. Um, in ceramics, adding more capacitors, more ceramics is almost always good. You just have to watch out for ringing. So if you add a bunch of ceramics, make sure you dampen it, damp it with a electrolytic or put resistor in series with your capacitor. Uh, but yeah, everything gets a ceramic cap. Um, the other biggest thing to prevent radiating emissions from your board is don't do two layer boards. Uh, two layer boards are incredibly difficult to do correctly. <laughs> and that's, and that's something I'm going to be going into quite a bit is just by going to, and like as jokingly as it is, it doesn't matter how good of a two layer board is at that you did if you go to a four layer board 99.9 .9 of the time if you do the stack up correctly it's going to make it better yeah, um, just because you have a whole bunch of like extra planes that are gonna yeah um, exactly because you have to think if you have a two layer if you have a two layer board you have your top signal layer you have your bottom and let's say your bottom layer is a hundred percent plane so it's as perfect of a two layer board as you can have mm -hmm. you have your top layer you have an entire FR4 prepreg core in between there. Yeah. So all of that energy is now in that massive dielectric space. If you have a four layer board, your top two layers are right there really close, in the yeah. core. So if you have your reference, and this is like Rick Hartley, he kind of changed from the old style, like Henry Ott, how multi stack ups are. Now the new school stack up is signal and power on top then your reference then signal well, two inner ground layers signal and power on the outer so you always have super tight coupling between every right. single layer uh, the old school way that like henry ott used to talk about and it was fine for the lower speeds and the lower rise times would be normally signal signal power ground that's so every about. power and ground is which makes routing so much easier I yeah mean, it's, it's much <laughs> easier if you have two ground in the middle you're burning a whole lane yes just for yes that, which uh, is devastating i mean like but the good part and this is where again the difference between like trying to do a really good let uh, uh uh design and just one that you can get done what's so nice about doing the two inner ground layers is as long as you only touch the two outer layers, you honestly don't have to care about much of anything because everywhere you route a trace, you have your reference right under it. Where Perfect. every other of the old school stack ups, you have to be super careful where your reference plane is. So you just don't even have to care. You just route it. And as long as you don't touch those two inner layers, you're good to go. Cool. So that's, that's another thing. I mean, yeah, obviously four layer boards are more expensive. At lower quantities, it's about 2x multiple but it's like, you're going to save a crap ton of time and it's going to make this, the, the actual layout much, much better. Sure. Yeah. Wow. And, the, and the PCBs are a fraction of the total project cost. Ex right? Exactly. Yeah. exactly. Yeah. exactly. Yeah. Especially when you get to, when you get to a uh, larger quantity. Cause I mean, you're talking, yes, it's still normally a two X multiple, but you're talking sometimes 40 cents versus 80 cents when you're selling this thing for 50 bucks, a hundred bucks, 200. It's like, that is almost irrelevant. My uh, what, what about, about, quality? What about uh, you know, differences in quality? You send uh, to the lab, you know, a prototype mm -hmm. that is going to be probably different quality than the products that you are going to turn out on the ship afterwards. If there is something, you know, yeah, I mean, again, if it's if it's the whole 
making sure and same with CE being uh, you can report on your own or it just has to pass on your side as long as you're confident that it's close enough that's that's all that matters that's where again with like pre-compliance testing it's just making sure that it's under the limit by a sufficient amount so yeah if you're going from a prototype and something's changing yeah i mean that's always a little sketchy but as as long as you're not making any massive changes and that's where again intentional radiators and like ul type stuff every change does matter and that's a completely different story wow wow there is some no joke depth to the specifics of this. Thing. I know. <laughs> it's so cool to hear about that. Like, I totally hear you. Like, a lot of people will do it till it works. Mm -hmm. and when it works exactly. It's like, oh, I'm done. But, like, there's a lot more that you can go mm -hmm. into of really quantifying the performance of the thing beyond just a binary. It does the thing versus yes. it doesn't do the thing. Um, that's cool. That's but yeah, it's just and it's it spooky. <laughs> and it just sucks because it needs to be more consistent. Like CE, like I said, and I've been on some of the Discord channels, like uh, some replacements for Tindy because of how big of a mess it is. It's like it's really unfair. And talking to Sion from Unexpected Maker, it's like they go from being able to sell in the EU because it seemed to be grandfathered into the evaluation board that the US is. And now it's not anymore. And it's like, that's not fair because it's like yeah. smaller companies. If you get caught for this, it's like, it, it's really bad. And it's like, it shouldn't be such a big gray area, mm -hmm. which is, is a massive shame. Yeah. 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 Crikey. I told you I wasn't going to be able to live up to Jason's uh, demo. We need to go back to some pretty LEDs. You did it in just a different way. In a, yeah, in a different was, way, but I mean, you absolutely did. That was awesome. super Absolutely brilliant. I think you're, there's going to be a lot of people watching your videos and uh, trying to learn what to do properly now. We'll uh, see. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm certainly going to take a take a look because uh, I've yeah, done really... some TVs I'm not proud of. So. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm excited the the EMC series because it's like I have a lot of experience doing like uh, designing boards and stuff for compliance testing. We do a lot of like compliance reviews, but I have next to none other than what I'm starting to now actual like hands-on test compliance, like in lab settings. So that's what I'm like super excited about is like actually seeing these tests done and like seeing like, Hey, I can change this. And then what happens with this and like, what makes it better? So that's what's super cool is it's like, I'm learning so much from actual like hands-on side, which I certainly never had. And I don't know of a resource out there right now that walks you through that specifically of like yeah. what are the knobs you turn in order yes. to get compliance in that way. Thank yes. you for making that. Like that's clearly a void of content <laughs> yeah. out there. Like that's cool. Well, I'm, I'm glad. That's the goal. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, any other I don't know. I'm that's that's all I had. Yeah, that was as I say, that was really good. And I think um it is about time we started paying a bit more attention to that kind of stuff. So, brilliant. I will yeah. definitely was, tuning in. It was enlightening in a totally different way. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> <It's very enlightening. laughs> the fun lives. <laughs> it's going to go on forever. <laughs> All right. So, um, I guess it's my turn, isn't it? And then we've got a quiz. So, I'll do my bit. I haven't got actually much to show. Um, some of it's not actually that interesting. So we'll see. I will, uh, Everybody says that. I want to switch back to me. Oh, there we go. Right then. So what have I been doing? Um, so talking about uh, emissions and wires and stuff, please ignore the uh, massive bundle of wires there because uh, that's probably not great. So I've been, I've been messing around with some audio stuff. So if I just uh, turn on this. So I've been playing MP3 files. So hopefully... We'll hear a classic YouTube channel. Oh, wow. <laughs> Which I think is used on pretty much every YouTube video ever. Yeah, what's this the guy's nice uh, name that makes all of them? All the, yeah. the open... <laughs> from that guy. <laughs> that guy, yeah, Ben Sounds. Ben Sounds. I better plug yep. it up. Ben Sounds. Yep. That's the guy. <laughs> so this is, um, this is playing an MP3 on the USB 32. So I was, uh, 
I was messing around with that, and we're using my um, my little stereo amplifier board, which I'm sure fails all emissions possible because <laughs> <laughs> I need to go and watch some videos. <laughs> that was a bit of fun. It was, it was surprisingly easy to actually do MP3 decoding, so I found it quite a nice library to do that. So, uh, so I don't know what how to turn board? it, what I turn it off. Um, this is a tiny Pico. So that's, um, oh, the amp board is a, it's a Max 98537, which is a Class D amplifier. Uh, should, should have put an off button on it. I'll just turn it off at the power. There we go. That's, um, so Adafruit do a do a board that's just a single chip, and um, I quite fancied having a stereo chip, so I thought I'd stick two on one board. The only problem is that when you play it uh, at maximum volume, it pretty much takes down the power supply because maximum <laughs> volume on a three watt amp is, <laughs> it's quite a few amps. <laughs> There's your emissions. <laughs> so, um, yeah, I had a. a on one of my videos, I've got a plot of the power supply coming in, and um, it looks terrible when you're playing it really loud. <laughs> it's just kind of, uh, <laughs> but eventually, it just drops down, and the and the ESP cuts out and uh, says so drown out, and then uh, it starts again. <laughs> so that's uh, that's been interesting. And then the other thing I've been playing with um, is lots of stuff with the ULP code processor on the ESP32. So I don't know if you actually see, yeah, you can see the, the stuff. So this has got a um, Swinging from the ADC and just comparing the sort of voltage levels and um, driving LEDs. But what's kind of interesting with this is it's all running on the ultra low power code processor. So it's not actually running any of the oh. ESP32 cores. It's all running oh, wow. um, on the low power thing. I mean, obviously, it's not particularly low power because there's a, there's a power LED. <laughs> I'm, also, um, <laughs> I'm also setting some LEDs on and off. But, um, but that was kind of fun. So it's kind of. There's obviously potential there for kind of the ULP. So you could do it in a sleep mode, right? Sorry? You could uh, put the main processor to sleep. Completely. Yeah, so the main processor is completely asleep. It's not even waking up. So even doing the LEDs, that's, that's still the ULP processor. So, so ULP is an actual core. It's just incredibly low power and like super limited peripheral access and stuff. Yeah, so they, they call it a, a simple finite state machine. I mean, it's kind of, okay. it's a very, very simple processor. It's got four registers. Um, it doesn't have a stack. It doesn't really, you can't really, not the, there's people who have simulated sort of stack framing on it. So you can use one of the registers as a stack pointer. So I just see a, a GitHub repo where a guy had written a whole kind of, Stacks and have I square C running and this bit banging all on ULP, which is pretty <laughs> impressive given wow. given it is really kind of limited. But you can you can read the ADC. It does have I square C built in, but only eight bit I square C. So you can do sort of basic peripherals, and it sort of it wakes up every. You schedule it to run with a certain time period, so it will wake up, do a bit of processing, and then switch itself off again. Cool. And it can make the main processor when certain things happen. So you could. You can build all sorts of clever stuff that stays in low power and only wakes up the processor when you actually detect something interesting. Um, you can store, there's about 16K of RAM, so you can store measurements. So potentially you could store a whole bunch of measurements and then wake up the main processor to square all the signals up to a server somewhere and then get, go back to sleep. So cool. it's pretty interesting. I, I got into it because I was playing around with the um, e-ink displays. And uh, so this is my... Um, ebook reader. I've just ported it to the M5 paper, which is pretty interesting. But um, one of the weird things is the battery is actually draining really fast on this. So you can almost, as you page through, you can see the battery going down. What you want from an ebook um, e paper display, but um, it does work really well. So this you're sure this that's not um, your progress through through the book? <laughs> <laughs> it might be. Uh, one of the books I've been testing with is um, Peter Rabbit, and I started getting comments about my uh, reading age being a bit low. But, uh, <laughs> <laughs> this is kind of fun, and I, I do actually. I really, I do like the M5 paper. So I was um, originally building on the on the Lilygo, which is which is nice. But my uh, my 3D printed case is not quite as good as a, a proper sort of injection molded case, but this works well as well. So this all uses low power mode as well. So it's quite, that's what got me into the ULP. It's just um, the buttons on this are all active low. And on the on the USB 32, there's a, there is a deep sleep mode that will detect button presses. 
and you can set multiple button presses, but it only works if the buttons are active high and then it will tell you which button was pushed. If they're active low, it just tells you a button was pushed, but it can't tell you which one. What a weird <laughs> place to draw the line. That's so funny. <laughs> I know, it's just the most bizarre kind of, we'll build it this way. Everyone has buttons that are active high. That must be how the world works. But no, it's, uh, these guys decided to put the buttons active low, so you can't use that mode. So you have to use ULP programming to scan the buttons and see what's, which one's pushed, and then wake up when that happens. So uh, that's been uh, this, um, this e-reader project. If you saw the last show, you'll know that that's been taking up a lot of my time. It's one of those projects that someone's actually got involved with, so they are contributing back, which is great. But it is it means kind you of, have to actually do it now. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> which is difficult. <laughs> but it's great, because it is, it is working really well. And, um, and M5 sent me a free device, so you can't really complain that much. It's, uh, <laughs> it's quite nice. So sure. that's what I've been up to. So mostly messing around with audio and uh, the ULP processor. So, so do you have any idea what might be causing the, the power draw uh, drain? Well, yeah, I'm not really sure. I mean, they do have, so on the back, you can see that uh, somewhere there's a, a MOSFET somewhere. So they have their own kind of way of managing the power. So there is a, a GPIO pin that you take high and that switches on a MOSFET, which then keeps power going to the ESP32. And if you drop that low, then it powers off the entire device. And then they've got an RTC chip that you can use to wake up the device again. So it's been designed to be used in that way where you actually power it off completely. And because I want to use the buttons to wake up and have the up and down buttons working, I'm leaving power switched on to the ESP32 and then going to deep sleep. So I think I'm probably leaving power on for something else on the device as well, or it's not, it's not been designed to work in that way. So I'm slightly abusing it. So I need to uh, only slightly. <laughs> only slightly. <laughs> I need to do some investigating and see what I'm doing wrong, and um, maybe I'll just switch back to the sort of powering off everything completely. It will wake up. You can push the uh, the jog button in when you're in sort of power off mode, and the RTC will wake you up. So I might I might switch back to um, doing it that way, just because that's the way they've designed it. Because the the Lily Go seems to work quite well in deep sleep mode, so. It's definitely possible, but um, yeah, not entirely sure why it doesn't work as it should. So <laughs> there is a needs investigation. So I will then. Um, I'm curious how you're storing the MP3 you were playing through your stereo driver. Is it is there like oh, a so that's chip that's on that? And yeah, that's actually on Spiffs. Yeah. So. Oh really? Okay. Yeah. Cool. So you can. I mean, you can. That's about thirty seconds. And I've compressed it quite aggressively, so yeah. it is kind of, it's not really audio file quality. I wouldn't, wouldn't play it to anyone who actually enjoys music, but it's, it's, pretty, <laughs> it's pretty good. I mean, if you've got an SD card, obviously you can, you can store as many as you yeah. want. So the M5's got an SD card. The Lilygo, I've got a SD card that I've just sold an adapter to stick it in. Here's, here's Peter Rabbit, just because uh, <laughs> you know Peter Rabbit. So no judgment. That's quite, <laughs> yeah. so, it's an easy beat. <laughs> so yeah, so the MP3. I mean, you'd probably in my video, I kind of joke and you say you can you can listen to a song from your from your flash drive, but it's it's really more if you want to do a kind of text to speech type thing and you want to store lots of words or numbers and stuff. Then yeah, you press yeah. it MP3. Did you find it was tricky to set up spiffs? Because I tried to do it one time on an um, ESP8266, and I found it was so difficult. I, I had to store an HTML file, and I wanted yeah. to it in spiffs. Instead, I just put it as a string in C++ yeah. and served it that I, way, because it was like, I couldn't get it to work. Was it pretty easy for you to do it on this? It's Well, I use platform my own, and that, that seems fairly straightforward, as so long as you know where they've hidden the button to upload the file system, because they moved it around and they put it away on some menu where it's quite hard to find. Yeah. I've had lots of problems with spiffs on the e-reader where um, writing to spiffs seems to just fail continuously. So I'm trying to write fairly for the for the Lilygo to um, when it goes into deep sleep, I persist the state of the display. So when it wakes up, it knows what the display was showing and it can Ooh. refresh itself correctly. But that involves saving a frame buffer to to spiffs and it's I zip it up, but it's still kind of 
30 or 40 K and it just sometimes works most of the time. It's, uh, <laughs> it's, it's to do with the way Spiff does garbage collection of the file system and you can increase the number of times it runs, but then it just sits there for about 10 seconds and then still gives up. So, oh, so no. kind of given up on, on writing to Spiff's now in, yeah. in this case, because it's, it doesn't really work very well. Um, I think little FS is yeah. supposed to be better, okay. but it's not quite supported on platform IO yet. You have to write some funny Python scripts. And it's called things. little FS? Little FS, yeah. yeah. Oh, cool. So okay. Spiffs is deprecated, and they're switching yeah, to little so it's FS. Not supposed to be more. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Okay. And uh, Stephen, you may have been having the problem very early on uh, with Spiffs. There was a bug with the uploader for the Arduino IDE, um, which seems oh. to be fixed now. So all of my boards run on ESP8266, and they host a, a website on the on you know on board, and sure. the, yeah. the, all the HTML, JavaScript, and CSS is, is all stored in Spiffs. Yeah. Yep. yep. I did that. So, it was like early 2018, and I just yeah, yeah might still it. be yep. early days for support. Um, it's a kind of moving target. It feels it's kind of <laughs> it sort of works. I mean, I, I do have yeah. I've not really had that many problems with it, but it's just writing to it seems to be the big issue. Um, yeah, sometimes I'll have to lower the uh, upload speed to get yeah. it to work, and then I I uh, gzip all of my files, mm -hmm. um, yeah. so they're actually stored in Spiffs, gzipped, and then the web server just streams them directly yeah. out of Flash uh, with the gzip. Um, HTTP header set, so it just cool. you know gets decrypted on the client or uh, yeah. de decompressed, decompressed on the client. Wow, that's cool as heck. Yeah, yeah, that's pretty great. That's very cool. Mm -hmm. All right, are we ready for a quiz? Heck yeah. Are you ready? <laughs> yeah, I'm ready. I've got my quiz ready. So, uh, all right, let's. Uh, how do we arrange the screen there? How do we <laughs> oh boy. Like that. You said it's it's like uh, okay. uh, 80s themed again? It's not really. It's not 80s themed. Oh, okay. Some of the uh, cultural references may be difficult. <laughs> before, before you were born, Stephen? Yeah, okay. Well, in I'll, a country we don't home. live in. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and yeah, the country. Yeah. Okay. Anyway, it's the quiz. <laughs> Major yeah. cast episode 34, the quiz. Um, you can play along at home as well. So if you if anyone's still here, then they can play along <laughs> as well. Um, it's all it's an honesty quiz, so I assume you'll all keep score of which ones you got right. Uh, there isn't really a prize, but if you're lucky, I might send you a certificate. <laughs> <laughs> Occasional Mr. Shastos. <laughs> okay, are we ready? Is everyone ready at home? I'm going to assume they are. So, the questions. Let's get started. So, question one. How many transistors did Intel's first processor, the 4004, have? Is it 200,000? 51,000? 2,300? Or 4,004? <laughs> <laughs> For sure. <laughs> okay. Right. The question, the answers come at the end. So just make a note of which one you want, and then we'll uh, move on to the next question. Okay. According to Wikipedia, what was the name of the first programmable electronic general purpose digital computer? Was it the Universal Automatic Computer 1, Univac 1? Was it the Electronic Numerical Integrator and Computer, or ENIAC? Was it the Harvard Mark I computer? Or was it the Manchester Mark I? <laughs> <laughs> okay. Oh. You haven't Christmas tree this bad in a while. <laughs> <laughs> Back in school. Okay. <laughs> Ready for the next question? <laughs> yes. Uh, question three, electronics. <laughs> <laughs> what logic function does this NAND gate circuit implement? <laughs> <laughs> Is it an XOR? Have I been really cheeky and it's just an AND? Is it an XNOR? Or have I been even more cheeky and it's actually just a NAND gate? <laughs> oh, man. <laughs> This, I'm going to put a time limit on this one because I don't want you reverse okay. engineering it. <laughs> <laughs> you 
want us to guess and not figure it out. Well, it should be your pattern recognition should cut in instantly. <laughs> <laughs> My electronics teacher from high school is going to be so disappointed in me. <laughs> Are we ready? Have we all analyzed the circuit and simulated it? 100%. Next question. <laughs> right. It's the music round. Let me, uh, let me turn my voice <laughs> around. <laughs> right. Which famous game used this music? Oh, gosh. <laughs> I what I know. Yeah. <laughs> This might be my first correct answer. <laughs> yeah, it might be my answer. Okay. Right then. <laughs> Was it Super Mario? <laughs> Tetris? Space Invaders? Or Pac Man? Okay. Ready for the next question? Yes. All right. It's a music round, but there's no music this time. When was the first compact disc released? Oh, man. Was it 1982? Oh, man. Was it 1975? 1991? Or 1989? And they're so close to each other. Makes <laughs> <laughs> oh, it so much harder to guess. And they were all before Stephen was born. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I, I'm literally thinking of like, I remember being like five and there being AOL CDs coming in the mail. I'm like, how long would it take to build the like global infrastructure? That's for that exactly what I was thinking. Get away? <laughs> and how many years would that take? And that's my guess. It's, it's pre internet, so you can knock out a few, well, one of the answers. So, or oh, two of the answers, maybe. I, I like zero. Was it, I, isn't internet like 95 ish? Isn't that generally accepted as the age? Is it? No. No? Uh, internet was before. Or like the first network, or like when. Oh, uh, okay, yeah. When, okay. Bonus question. When was he <laughs> <laughs> I don't know the answer to it either, so. <laughs> uh, oh. Mako reckons he's 100% so far, so. God, I'll tell you, we're. I forgot on the answer to some of these questions. So, let's do the next one. <laughs> these are good ones. <laughs> Movies and TVs. It is the lot of man to strive, no matter how content he is. Which guy from Star Trek said this? Was it Kirk? Was it Spock? Was it Bones? Or was it Scotty? I was really hoping the question was going to be, what show was that from? <laughs> <laughs> you know, I would have certainly of got that. Off on the complexity of the, of the specificity <laughs> of the question. I was certainly going to get it right. The next question is, what episode was it from? <laughs> <laughs> and what time during the episode? <laughs> <laughs> What's the timestamp? <laughs> okay, next question. <laughs> Okay, huge cat. Who, uh, whose catchphrase is "By Grapfar's hammer, I will avenge you"? Is it Thor? He does have a hammer. Is it Doctor Lazarus? Is it Commander Worf? Or is it Ming the Merciless? <laughs> <laughs> My second correct answer. Okay, Jason. Jason looks confident. And so does Stephen. I, <laughs> this instills confidence. Okay, there's only, there's only three more questions left. So, oh, I just watched this movie. Oh, okay, I'm gonna get two right. I'm gonna get yeah. at least two right. My third. I don't know the name of the this. And I, I have to be clear: the big computer in more games, because I don't want you getting confused with the guy hacking. So it's not the guy who's hacking, not his computer. The proper big computer. Is it the TRS-80? <laughs> <laughs> The Whopper, <laughs> the Vic 20, or Hal. <laughs> <laughs> okay, ready? Question nope. nine. The robots are taking over. What was the name of Doctor Who's robotic companion? Was it K2SO? Was it K9? Was it Johnny 5? Or was it Kronos? <laughs> <sighs> okay, last question. <sighs> Do you want chips with that? This is supposed to be the tiebreaker question. So, in 2019, 11,810 million square inches of silicon wafers were shipped. 
What was the number in 2020? 2020 is the year where on every graph they have to put an asterisk next to the data for it. That was that XKCD about it. Was it 12,407? <laughs> was it 22,567? Was it 11,678? Or was it 9,686? This is going to be a pretty much a random guess, to be honest. That's nothing to see. Same with the nine before this. <laughs> <laughs> oh my god, I was following. Oh, and someone's pointed out <laughs> silicone. Should be silicon, <laughs> obviously. Trick question. Yes. Oops. <laughs> right. Okay. That's the end. There were no more questions. Shall we see the answers? There were no yes, right please. answers. <laughs> <laughs> okay. okay. How many transistors? What did everyone guess? What were you thinking? I said C. D. C. C. <laughs> C. The answer is B. C. Oh. Ah. But if you look really carefully, you can count them. <laughs> <laughs> What does anyone know? I'm sure someone does. Why it's 404? Like, why is that the part number? Um, I they wouldn't make it that for the number of transistors. I like, did. Five, five, when five. I, yeah, when I was doing the quiz, I did read it on Wikipedia. Unfortunately, I forgot. So, <laughs> I'm hoping someone in the audience will know. Anyone know in the audience? Register sizes could be. Do we think it's register sizes? Does that make sense? Four bits. It's... Four bits could be. Yeah, it was a four, oh, yeah, bit. sure, four bits. It was four bits, wasn't it? Yeah. David, you get a special bonus prize. Of a <laughs> certificate. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay, question two. Um, so, does anyone get this one? I we don't know. A. Tell us the answer. <laughs> <That's> it. <laughs> it was the ENIAC 1945. Oh, that was my second um, guess. Yeah. I guess. The Harvard oh. was earlier, but it was electromechanical apparently, so it doesn't count. And um, the Manchester Mark One is behind my name. That was 1948. So, yeah, didn't, they, didn't they rename it after a while? Because like it, it, other people made other computers after following a similar naming scheme, and it got like really confusing and annoying. So they just like switch. I read something about this very recently. So we should throw this question out. Yeah. <laughs> so you can't throw the question out. <laughs> 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 I'm just blindly agreeing with people now. <laughs> okay, next question. So, oh man, this one. It's um, XNOR. Stephen got it right. I guess. I'm not going to yeah. lie. I just guessed. <laughs> so there I knew we go. It was an I, I figured it was XOR or XNOR. Yeah, that's an XNOR. There we go. Yeah. So. Okay, the music round. I think everyone got this. So I won't play it too much. It was Tetris. So, total by a sneaky. Did anybody else go to sleep still hearing this music? Like, because <laughs> I totally did. Haunt your dreams. <laughs> yes. Okay, it was 1982. And if you oh. were immensely wealthy, you could have afforded one of these very nice. CD players. Uh, the embedded hobbyist worked out the logic goes, so he reverse engineered the circuit. It's very good. Well cool. done. Pretty <laughs> impressive. Okay, 1982 compact discs. There you go. I think it was maybe ABBA or it was some classical music that came out. Um, <laughs> yeah, I would have been about 11, so I don't remember. Right, what's the next question? <laughs> okay, so. Who's this quote from? Anyone want to stand a guess while I'm standing? Spock. I, I, said, Spock. I said Kirk. I feel, oh. like, I feel like Spock wouldn't know what man is all about, you know? No, oh, but he's half human. I guess so, but... It was it was Spock. It's oh, always yeah. man. Every quote is Spock, because he's got the most interesting things to say. That's fair. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> um, so this was... It wasn't Thor, even though Thor has a hammer. It was... Dr. Lazarus mm -hmm. in Galaxy Quest. Yes, oh. you all have homework to go watch it if you haven't. I yes, haven't. it's a brilliant film. Excellent. Definitely worth seeing. Okay, question eight. 
It was, of course, the Whopper, which stands for anyone know what it stands for? I bet Unexpected Maker knows. Uh, sure. Yeah, what does it stand for? Uh, <laughs> he's, he's thinking. Okay. Nice w one. is world. <laughs> world. Yeah, so let's quickly ask the internet. Give me one second. And for uh, war operations planned response. War operation plan. I was close. War operation plan response. Very good. Oh, right. Right. Once program ready. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yep. <laughs> and Sean, Sean, Sean did get there in the end. So very good, Sean, on the ball. He's just woken up and he's got the answer. <laughs> <laughs> okay, next question. It was, of course, good old K9. It's of course. Cool. I got this. Um, that was a guess. <laughs> yes. oh. Okay. What is K2SO from? I, I, that sounds. Uh, that was from Star Wars. Star Wars. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Um, I think it was in the Mandalorian, right? Johnny Five is um, short circuit. Kronos. Forgot yeah. what Kronos is. Yeah. yeah. The day the the world okay. stops. I think. Which one? The day the world stood still. Ah, yes. I think you're right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. The world, yeah. The shipper. Bonus point for you. Very good. Uh, the answer to this one. Do you think it was higher or lower? I guess that's the uh, that's the question. I guess lower. I think lower because, like, still COVID's going to mess with that significantly. Yeah. I don't think it was more. It was actually more. Really. So, only slightly more, but uh, still more. So this whole chip crisis, I think it's just made up. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, well, what's the 2021 number? That's I what I want to see. Playing. <laughs> I don't know. Um, yeah, it's not done sure. yet, so. <laughs> not done yet, yeah. That Those was are great. Best. Those so, are awesome questions. <laughs> who, who got the highest score? Not me. I, I got six. I got six. 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 I have six as well. Six as well? Well, I got four, so I definitely did not win. <laughs> so I'll make it easy on everyone. I think the uh, I think the audience wins. They're all getting yeah, seven. Probably. Yeah, that's terrible. Oh, someone got an eight. Yeah, seven on average wow, is an eight. That's nice. Nice. Oh, who won? The audience won. Yeah. Who won out of us? I think it was a... Uh, Three-way three tie. Three-way tie. Three tie. Three tie, yeah. Three-way tie. I just wanted to be different. <laughs> <laughs> you, you, get the, you get the uh, certificate for taking part. <laughs> yeah, <this is> participation <laughs> certificate. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for turning up. <laughs> <laughs> well, that was a great show. I, uh, I enjoyed that a lot. Yes. Yeah, yeah it was great. <laughs> Thanks for hosting, Chris. Uh, anytime, any well, actually not anytime because I've done it twice. Now. <laughs> <laughs> but you're so good at it. <laughs> no, really, fantastic job. Yes, oh, well, thank, thank you, Chris. Oh, it was brilliant. Yep. All right, well, I think we should end the live stream and let the audience get to bed before we keep them up too late. So, uh, thanks everyone. Yeah, lots of stamps needed. I've got to send everything to a certificate. Everyone in the audience, so everyone gets a certificate. I will. Uh, I'll put it somewhere you can download it and customize it yourself. There we go. That's the <laughs> <answer>. <laughs> <laughs> All right, cheers, everyone. I'm going to end the broadcast now. Bye, Ron. Bye. Bye, Ron.